Ladies and gentlemen, this is Scott Pollack, Chief Editor of the Critical Post Chicago, reporting. Welcome to another edition of the Critical Post Chicago Report. Thanks again, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning us in on our official YouTube broadcast channel. We appreciate it. If you can remember to go over to the head page of the Critical Post Chicago and click on an ad anywhere on that page, we'd appreciate your participation there. It costs you nothing to get us some small remuneration for our expenses. Google will pay us. There is another new episode of the Bittersweet Records Radio Hour on the head page of the post. We hope you enjoy that as well. We'd like to welcome our new subscribers at our YouTube broadcast channel. We appreciate your kind attentions, and we hope we can live up to your high standards and expectations for what we term as the only non-propaganda news channel in the country that we're aware of. Our bias in terms of editorial view is private property rights, anti-IRS confiscatory policies, and in terms of investigations, exposing judicial malfeasances and corruptions. Coming up after this broadcast will be broadcast editorials about Britain's exit from the European Union and an opinion on tariffs. Another report will be our review of an investigation regarding assertions made by one Ms. Duana Hooper Breedlove Samimi and the connections that, I are, that, that Iran has to the U.S. prison system and the incidences in her life which led her to the Critical Post's attention. The interview transcript is quite extensive and was prepared by the Critical Post Chicago's own Julia May. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the latest headlines. Domestic terrorism again is dominating the airwaves in support of the war on terror. Everyone knows, ladies and gentlemen, by now that a mass shooting in an Orlando, Florida nightclub popular with gay men called Pulse began flooding the airwaves early this morning. There are several reports which have conflicting numbers as to the fatalities total. At latest count, 50 people dead, including the gunman and more than 53 wounded. The gunman has been identified by U.S. journalism channels as one Mr. Omar Mateen, an American citizen of Afghani ethnic origin. As reported, the gunman walked into the nightclub armed with a rifle and started shooting. He took hostages into a bathroom in the nightclub. He was subsequently engaged, shot, and killed in a standoff with Orlando's SWAT team units. Orlando's police chief, John Mina, said he was in possession of multiple pieces of weaponry. An independent records search found he held a Florida security officer's license and a state firearms license. In other reports, Mateen's father insists to those re recording his statements that his son was not involved with any terrorist activity, claiming his son became enraged when seeing gay men kissing each other. Mr. Mateen was born in America in 1986 to Afghan parents in New York City. Mateen had committed himself to ISIS before carrying out the attack by calling 911 federal officials are reported to have said. In other reports, the terrorist 
called emergency 911, swearing his allegiance to Islamic State leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, law enforcement officials have said. So there are conflicting reports. Several more reports have now come onto the wires claiming that the gunman's ex-wife has admitted to authorities that he was battering her, suggesting he was a serial domestic violence and abuser of women, and that he was not a stable person. It is also reported by several journalism outlets that the Islamic State has been calling for attacks to be carried out on the American made land targeting the gay community over the past few months. Of further note, it is interesting to state that as of now, no one has reported how the gunman was able to get into the nightclub with weapons before he started shooting. Almost immediately after the attack, British journalism channels began to propagandize and politicize the event by publishing smear pieces in their national journalism channels about the AR-15 rifle allegedly used by the gunman to carry out the attack. These publishings are obviously PR hit pieces attacking the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution and an attempt by British journalism to continue to weigh in on the American gun control debate. Not to be outdone, the president, several political figures, including Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, and Donald Trump, were known to have made statements emanating from their Twitter accounts and, in the case of the president, a speech on national TV. There are reports stating that FBI authorities were monitoring the young man as far back as 2013 and 2014, but was not singled out for any further contract contact previous to the incident. The reports do not state how many times over two indicated by the years cited about FBI encounters that the FBI had, in, had interviewed the man. Reports are claiming it is the largest terrorist event since September 11, 2001, topping the San Bernardino incident of 14 fatalities just a couple of months ago. It cannot be known, ladies and gentlemen, whether or not the man was subject to MK Ultra mind control techniques used in those FBI encounters, known to be used on subjects like Sirhan Sirhan of the Bobby Kennedy assassination. Therefore, it cannot be known if this man was a Man Manchurian candidate or a self-radicalized malcontent, as the current reports would seem to suggest. In this particular case, the normalcy bias would have the latter case stand. Movements in the global regime of international economic interdependence. Another PR trial balloon surfaces in Western journalism and Switzerland. Six months ago, one of the analysts we listened to here at the Critical Post told a black talk show host working in Washington, D.C., one Mr. Carl Nelson of the Carl Nelson Show, which airs dr in drive time hours in America's capital city, that he'd heard there were conversations being held behind the scenes that board members of corporate corporations and highly monetized world class transnational corporations were publishing white papers which is considering giving everyone in the world a guaranteed monthly stipend of between one thousand to two thousand dollars a month. On Sunday, June fourth, the in Switzerland of this year, a referendum was held in that country asking for a yay or a nay about a nationwide guaranteed income. About 77% of the voters rejected a plan to give a basic monthly income of 2,500 Swiss francs or about 2,560 U.S. dollars to each adult and 625 francs for each child under 18, regardless of employment status, to fight poverty and social inequality and guarantee a dignified life to everyone. Switzerland was the first country to vote on a universal basic income plan, but other countries and cities either have been considering the idea or have started trial programs. Finland is set to introduce a pilot program for a ran random sample of about 10,000 adults who will each receive a monthly handout of 550 euros 
about $625 USD. The intent is to turn the two-year trial into a national plan if it proves successful. In the Netherlands, Utrecht is leading a group of municipalities that are experimenting with similar pilot projects. In the United States, the idea of a guaranteed income has gained some traction in the run-up to the presidential election in November. It has been promoted by some Democrats who are demanding more social justice. But it also has some right-wing advocates who see it as a better alternative to government welfare programs such as Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Last night again on the evening show of conservative talk show host Michael Medved, he cited it, a noted conservative floating the same suggestions. The trade war in steel manufacturing is continuing. Over the past few months that we've been tracking reports coming in from across the globe from various journalism outlets, it appears that it's like a likely conclusion that China had initially started the trade war in the steel market and now Commerce bureaus in the U.S. and Europe are ramping up their efforts to deal with the alleged unfair practices and rolled steel product dumping of both varieties known as hot and cold rolled product. Recently, an EU commission has launched an investigation into whether the communist government of China has been subsidizing its manufacturers, causing a glut in the world market, which has effectively begun to shut down production in Britain and other centers in Europe. In response to British measures, China has imposed a 46% tariff on high-tech steel manufactured product being exported into China from the UK. Japan and South Korea manufacturers are also accused of the practice by the U.S. and its allies in Europe. In response to everything, the U.S. has raised its tariffs on steel product coming from China as much as 522% in the past six months. The U.S. Commerce Department said recently in a statement that dumping margins were 266% for Chinese imports and 71% for our Japanese cold rolled imports. Dumping margin means how much advantage the dumping nation has in terms of competitive advantage over the targeted importer such as the United States. Steel products of this variety are used in everything from cars to electrical appliances. From other reports, as early as 2012 concerning litigations overseen by the World Trade Organization, which properly termed is an international governing organization, it appears that the trade war began in that year by China by imposing large tariffs on British steel tubing exports into China. Possible effects of the trade war is felt in the U.S. jobs market. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has stated that over the past four months, manufacturing has lost 53,000 jobs. In May, employment in durable goods fell by 18,000, led by 7,000 job losses in machinery. In January 2015, Employment reached a peak in machinery and since then has declined by 60,000 jobs. Mining and oil and gas machinery counted for over half of the jobs lost during this period. In May, employment also declined in furniture and related products by 3,000 jobs. The taxes of 522% specifically apply to Chinese-made cold-rolled flat steel, which is used in car manufacturing, shipping containers, and construction. The U.S. Commerce Department ruling comes amid heightened trade tensions between the two sides over several products, including chicken parts. There is also dispute over U.S. exported pork livestock product to China over the use of a specific delicing power powder sprayed on hogs to prevent disease in the animals before being butchered and released into the general population for consumption. However, steel is an especially sensitive issue. U.S. and European steel producers claim China is distorting the global market and undercutting them by dumping its excess supply abroad. 
The Commerce Department also leveled anti-dumping duties of 71%, as stated earlier, on Japanese-made cold-rolled steel. On the physical front pertaining to international trade, several dozens of reports have hit the wires that cite Russian as well as Chinese jet fighters on numerous occasions have been buzzing American and British surveillance planes in the skies over international waters or in other cases flying very close to U.S. and British airspace. In another case, there have been reports of a, Rus of a Russian submarine being intercepted by British vessels in their naval fleet. As well, it is reported that the British claim they're trying to steal secrets pertaining to the British Trident submarine class of deep sea vessels. All of these reports have been hitting the airwaves after the 2012 United States budget deal concerning a continuing budget resolution wherein a quote unquote sequester has been implemented and reducing spending on the military in America by a 10% reduction in spending across the board. In an interview on another channel we monitor, a former Reagan administration official, one Mr. Paul Craig Roberts, had suggested that when American diplomatic authorities do not get the concessions they want from either Chinese or Russian diplomats, they are automatically labeled as a threat to the security of the United States. Mr. Roberts asserted these are ludicrous claims and has nothing to do with reality. He said that on the heels of asserting that a British general, Sir Richard Shiref, former Allied commander of NATO until 2014, had stated that it's entirely plausible we may have a nuclear war with Russia. This comes on the heels of the British general's subsequent publishing of a novel called 2017 War with Russia, in which nuclear war breaks out with Russia over the Baltic nations next year. According to Mr. Roberts, this is indefensible that a British general would suggest such an outcome openly, he said, which is directly pro provocational to Russian authorities stating, if you were Russian military council advisor, what would that statement make you think? The British general said... In interviews with various journalism channels, the chilling fact is that because Russia hardwires nuclear thinking and capability to every aspect of their defense capability, this would be a nuclear war. The general added, we need to judge President Putin by his deeds, not his words. Furthermore, he stated he has an invaded Georgia, he has invaded the Crimea, he has invaded Ukraine, he has used force to and got away with it. The general concluded, in a period of tension, an attack on the Baltic states is entirely plausible. The question this anchor desk has in light of Mr. Roberts' remarks, is this a PR trial balloon to suggest that nuclear war is an option which Western Alliance population should come to grip with as per, per the NATO Alliance multi national corporations. Mr. Roberts states, These nuclear weapons are hydrogen bomb warheads. They are 17,000 times more powerful than the bombs dropped on Japan to end the Second World War. He further states that if 10% of these weapons were deployed from both sides of the conflict, Nuclear bomb engineers have declared there would be no life left here on Earth in the aftermath. Another question this anchor desk would have is British General Sharif or Sharef separately a change agent provocateur put into the field by clandestine semantical operations as propagandists for promoting a growing sentiment of fear and helplessness in the Western civilized world. This particular piece of journalism by the Western International Press has been totally ignored on the mass broadcast channels here in America. It is well known to this anchor desk that PR trial balloons of this nature are always floated months before, perhaps even years before the journalism channels, before anything 
by the journalism channels before anything of substance in the direction of the report surfaces as a physical fact. The ongoing battle on Capitol Hill about women being required to register for the draft. Senator John McCain tried to slip in an amendment provision in the current version of the National Defense Authorization Act to require women to register with the Select Service even after the House of Representatives had earlier struck the provision in their version of the NDAA. A few days ago, Senator McCain took to the Senate floor excoriating certain senators were not backing the NDAA as is amended. Senator Mike Lee of Utah has filed an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act that would remove the provision and block any court, including the Supreme Court, from hearing cases about who must register with the Selective Service System. Secretary of Defense Ash Carter announced in December that the Pentagon would open all combat roles to women. The draft, which ended in 1973, has been in the spotlight since the Pentagon began, began opening more roles to female soldiers. A Rasmussen Reports poll released earlier this year found that 49% of all likely U.S. voters think women should be required to register for the draft, compared to 44% who disagree. A statistical model predicts Don Trump will be the next president of the United States. Helmut, Nor Helmut Norpoff, a professor of political science, science at Stony Brook University, has developed a statistical model that predicts a 97 to 99 percent chance that Trump will win the 2016 presidential election. Norpoth's model has correctly predicted the outcome of every single presidential election since 1912, save one, the election of 1960, which some believe was rigged. It uses a candidate's performance in their party's primary coupled with electoral cycle patterns to determine the likely outcome of the general election. Bayer AG makes a bid to buy Monsanto. Bayer AG, a German corporation, offered $62 billion to buy Monsanto Company. The German company said it had told Monsanto it's willing to pay $122 a share in cash. Buying Monsanto would allow Bayer to trap growing demand at a time when farmers must boost productivity to feed an estimated 10 people billion globally by 2050. Bayer Chief Executive Officer Werner Baumann has suggested that notion will convince skeptical investors of the value of the deal and help overcome public backlash at home against Monsanto's genetically modified seeds as he seeks to pull off the biggest corporate takeover ever by a German company. If Bayer AG succeeds with the bid and takeover, it would make the German corporation the undisputed leader and largest producer in the world for seed products. We'll keep an eye out for more developments about this item. And finally, a scientist's daughter may have suggested another cure for cancer. A British research scientist's daughter may have suggested a cost-effective measure to combat cancer over dinner one evening a while back. The eight-year-old's name is Camilla Lissanti. Over dinner one evening, her father asked her what she would do to cure cancer, prompting the little girl to remark, You mean like when I have a sore throat, which in turn suggested to her scientist's parents to look at antibiotics as a cure. Professor Lasanti and his wife, Federica Sotgia, a husband and wife cancer research team at Manchester University, UK, tested the theory at their lab and were surprised when several cheap and widely used antibiotics destroyed the cancerous cells. Some antibiotics stop cells from making mitochondria, which supplies cells with energy. Cancer stem cells, which create tumors and keep them alive, often have high numbers 
of mitochondria. Their research showed that four common antibiotics, which can cost as little as six cents a day compared to some of the latest drugs, which can cost hundreds of pounds you, uh, in British pounds, killed these stem cells in samples from breast, prostate, lung, ovarian, pancreatic, skin, and brain tumors. Crucially, the antibiotics did not harm healthy cells. Professor Lasanti now believes that antibiotics could prove to be an inexpensive and safe method in treating cancer thanks to his daughter's suggestion. On the other side of the coin, Dr. Alan Worsley, Cancer Research UK's Senior Science Communications Officer, uh, otherwise read Propaganda Officer, told journalism channels, there's no indication from this work that these particular antibiotics would kill cancer cells in patients or what sort of side effects there might be. Some antibiotics have been known to have anti-cancer effects since the 1960s and are a well-established part of cancer treatment today alongside other chemotherapies. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all for the news in this particular weekly report. We'll be back soon. Again, this is Scott Pollack, Chief Editor of the Critical Post Chicago Reporting. Thanks again for watching another Critical Post Chicago report. We'll be back soon. That is all.